thanks for having me. This has been a, a really cool blockchain stage day. Um, so I'm going to talk about the future of money and what we call the longest tail, user-generated currencies. I like to start with this slide. Um, there are people in here that are more familiar with blockchain, less familiar with blockchain. I start with this because pretty much everything around you at one point sounded ridiculous to people, from walking on the moon to communicating over email, and certainly blockchain often sounds a little bit like this to us today. This photo is taken in Palo Alto, where I grew up. And the next kind of concept I want to bring to the table is by a book uh, called Sapiens. Has anyone read it? Cool. It's a great book. I highly recommend it. Um, and I bring it here because in the first chapter, uh, he talks about how humans are different than apes, essentially, and other animals in the animal kingdom. And we're the same in many, many ways. We procreate. We have families. We do things together. We protect. Uh, we eat. We groom, but there's a fundamental way that humans are different from all the animals that came before us. And that thing that we do that's totally unique is we tell stories. We tell each other stories, we imagine stories, and we create consensus around stories that allow us to organize in increasingly greater and more complex ways. So a good example of this is if you put 100,000 apes in Times Square, you'd probably get violence and chaos. But if you put 100,000 people in Times Square, we know how to handle that. Why? Because we have stories like walk on green and stop on red, and this is where the people go, and this is where the cars go. Um, and these stories allow us to coexist and collaborate, hopefully, um, in greater numbers over time. Money is one of our greatest stories one of the greatest stories that people have told ourselves and each other since the beginning of uh, mass collaboration. So what is money? Money is a tool for us to collaborate. We used to do this in our families, we used to do this in our tribes, we used to do this with barter. I have something you might want and you have something I might want. And money allowed us to separate what I have from what I need over time and space, which means I can collaborate now with an increasingly larger group of people, not just the person that has what I need right now, um, but someone who might have what I need next week or next month or next year. Um, and so that is why we invented money, to have a shared accounting system for people. This, by the way, is another story, that we need a shared accounting system, that we need to keep track of who gives what. Hopefully, this system tells us when you have a lot of money, you've given a lot to society. And this money credits you with things from society that you can get now or later. That's a story. So let's talk about money and kind of how it's changed uh, over time since, since we know it. In the beginning of money, and we call this money 1.0, money came from the earth. That was the tool that we used as our shared accounting system. It was gold, it was silver, it was copper, it was seashells, it was oil, it was salt, it was things that came from the earth that we could point to, that we knew what they were, that we knew if they were real, um, and that we knew there was a finite amount of um, that we could trust in this accounting system. Then money 2.0, which is the era that we still find ourselves in today, money came from the governments. Um, we allow our governments the responsibility and the privilege to print the money, whether it's paper or digital, whether it was gold coins stamped by the king. Our governments have uh, the unique and monopoly right to say what is money, how much of there is, how much of it there is, and most importantly, who gets it? Where does it go when it comes right off the printing press? Who gets it first, um, and how does it get distributed from there? Money 3.0 is by far the most exciting era of money, uh, in my opinion, and many folks who work in blockchain today. Uh, money 3.0 is when money comes from the people. So by the people, I mean the creators of Bitcoin. Those are people, maybe a person or people. Uh, the creators of Ethereum, the creators of Bancor, the creators of hundreds, if not thousands, of currencies that you may or may not have heard of. These people are creating money. And thanks to blockchain, this money is also usable and trusted, of course, to varying degrees. So here are some currencies and some tokens that you might be familiar with. Some of them you might have heard about today. And the challenge with having now 
hundreds, thousands, and soon to be millions of currencies, is that the value of a currency is in its liquidity. What do I mean by that? It's not the money that you want, ever. It's the things the money can buy, right? It's not the coin or the paper uh, or the digital Bitcoin. It's the lunch or the house or the massage or the healthcare. Um, the liquidity of the money, the ability for the money to become the thing that you want is its value. That's what makes it valuable. So liquidity is really the name of the game, and it's what we focus on at Bancor. Today, these are the currencies that are the most liquid in the world, again, to varying degrees, depending which country you're looking at. These are our national fiat currencies, the one printed and issued by our governments. You could add to this list some new and liquid currencies like Bitcoin and Ether and maybe a handful more. But for the hundreds and thousands and millions of currencies to come, this kind of liquidity is simply not available. I want to walk you through a, a small pilot that my team and I created now uh, four years ago when it was even more ridiculous to talk about currencies and blockchain. Uh, we ran a pilot in Israel um, called the Heart Market, and we issued a currency called Hearts, and it was a currency specific to a community of mothers. Uh, now, the mothers could earn these hearts by joining the group, uh, by bringing other mothers into the group by doing all kinds of things that the mothers decided were value add for the community, like volunteering in schools uh, or donating toys and clothes that they didn't need anymore. Um, and then they could use these hearts to shop in a marketplace that was essentially a shopping mall where all the stores were the other moms in the community, right? So kind of a, a community currency just for these mothers. And we saw tremendous, tremendous engagement in just a year. Um, 20,000 mothers did about $24 million worth of commerce just in hearts. No shekel traded hands, no dollar traded hands, uh, just in hearts between the moms. Um, and it was incredibly abundant for these families, incredibly abundant for these children who now had access to things they just didn't have before, like a birthday cake um, or a tutoring session. And we were asked all the time, you know, why weren't they doing this before? What's unique about the heart that they couldn't do with the regular money? And the answer was, they just didn't have the regular money. Many of these moms were in low-income neighborhoods. They didn't have any extra money in their pockets to buy a birthday cake or a new toy or a tutoring session. And so the injection of these hearts into this community was like a, what we call a quantitative easing. It was essentially an increased budget of money for this specific community, and it allowed them to have a tremendous amount of commerce. So I'll go back to here for one second. Um, what's the problem? Why can't everyone just print their own money like these mothers printed their own hearts? Remember that problem we talked about called liquidity? So as soon as a mother left the community or went to shop in her regular grocery store or in her regular neighborhood or outside of her neighborhood, no one would accept the hearts, right? This is the fundamental essence of liquidity. If your currency isn't accepted by other people, it becomes increasingly less valuable over time. So Bancor set out to solve this problem for the upcoming millions and millions of currencies that we would encounter in this user-generated landscape. There's a challenge today, which is that currencies, in order to be liquid, need to be listed on exchanges. They need to pay extremely high fees. They need to have a lot of volume for this trade to be profitable for exchanges to list them to begin with. And guess what? The hearts are not that profitable for exchanges, but they're extremely, extremely valuable for these mothers. So the Bancor protocol, you may have heard of this token generation event last June, just a year ago. Um, it attracted a tremendous amount of support from a tremendous group of contributors Oh, almost 11,000 contributors in this token sale in just under three hours. And the Bancor protocol set out to establish what we call smart tokens. Smart tokens are really smart. How and why are they smart? Um, there's a lot of concepts up here, and I'll tell you in a nutshell what smart tokens know how to do. Smart tokens know their exchange rates to other smart tokens. Smart tokens are continuously and automatically exchangeable outside of exchanges for any other token in the network. Essentially, the way that we do this is that a smart token owns a small amount of another token in its smart contract. You can think of this like a balance or a deposit. And through that embedded inventory, 
every token in the network is constantly exchangeable for every other token, and the price is algorithmically fluctuating to maintain balance in the system. When tokens are being bought, their prices are going up, and when tokens are being sold, their prices are going down, all without ever matching buyers and sellers. So if I have hearts, I don't need to find someone who wants to buy hearts from me in a system like this. A heart has a continuous exchange rate to this network, and I can autonomously exchange it for any other currency that I'm connected to. So the concept of having millions of currencies sounds overwhelming, uh, I'm sure, to many people. And I love to bring up this book, uh, Rethinking Money by Bernard Lyotard. Bernard was the creator of, one of the creators of the Euro. Uh, he was a central banker in Belgium and he was commissioned uh, to do that project. And he's been studying monetary theory for over 40 years from every seat in the industry. And this book is fascinating because it compares monetary systems to natural ecosystems, right? When you think of blood moving through a body and taking nutrients from organ to organ, or you think of the rainforest full of different uh, entities that are somehow working together to keep the ecosystem uh, progressing, um, he looks at monetary systems in the same way. And he says that when systems are very, very efficient, they are also not very resilient. Right, so things like, um, imagine having one universal language. We all speak English. Uh, if anything happens to the people who speak English, language as we know it is gone. When we have a diversity of languages, we have a kind of redundancy. It's true that it's not the most efficient. It's true that we sometimes can't communicate, and it's true that we might need to invent things like Google Translate to help us communicate across languages. And the same goes for money. If we had one currency for the whole world, it's true that it would be very efficient. We wouldn't have exchange rates. We'd all know what prices meant. However, if anything happened to that currency, and as we know, when we have one of anything, it tends to uh, pool and centralize within powerful hands, there are no other currencies for the people to use. There's no other blood moving through the system. And so he really advocates for a multi-currency world uh, and in fact, when we encountered him and he understood the automation involved in the Bancor protocol and allowing millions and many more currencies to be automatically tradable in a not-for-profit and continuous way, he said that this would be one of the pathways to achieving the UN Sustainable Development Goals. If you've heard of these, the SDGs, basically the UN says that we're about $400 trillion short of having a decent world clean water for everyone, clean air, uh, eradicating poverty, basic quality of life, $400 trillion. Who thinks the countries of the UN are going to contribute $400 trillion anytime soon to solving these problems? What Bernard says is that the only way to create this money is to create this money. More currencies in more places by more people to solve more problems. So a phenomenon we talk about a lot in the internet is called the long tail. Anyone know what the long tail is? A couple people have heard of it. So the long tail basically says that when we lower technical barriers to entry, when we make it easy for people to use platforms like YouTube, like WordPress, um, other tools that we know on the internet, what we end up seeing is that hundreds of millions of people approach these tools and try to use them. And when we aggregate the volume, whatever metric we're measuring for, whether it's views on videos or reads on blogs um, or purchases on small products on Amazon, what we see is that the aggregate volume of the long tail is two to three orders of magnitude greater than the hits. So what does that mean in YouTube? The hundreds of millions of videos you've never watched have more views than the Justin Bieber video or the Beyonce video or all the top hits that maybe you have watched, I've watched. Um, so that's the long tail phenomenon. And I'll take you to an even nerdier phenomenon, which is super cool. Um, it's called Reed's Law. So basically, the internet brought us Metcalf's Law. Before that, we only had broadcast, right? A TV station, a radio station, one to many. The internet was so profound for human communication and collaboration because it brought us many to many. It brought us forums. It brought us Wikipedia. It brought us tools where everyone could engage and could engage with each other. That's significant. What Reed's Law says is when you allow people to create their own networks on top of these platforms, 
and all of these networks, of course, can speak to each other and interact with each other, what you have is an exponential increase in the value of your network. So it's not one to many, and it's not many to many. It's many networks to many networks. And when you take this, think of examples that we know like Facebook groups, right? Everyone has a profile on Facebook. Every user on Facebook can interact with every other user on Facebook. But we can also have groups where now my group, my tech open air group, can interact with a different group, another conference that I'm interested in. Every person can still interact, but the groups themselves can interact. And so the value of the network increases exponentially. And the reason that I bring this up, I'll take you back to the long tail, We've been talking about information products like video and blog and, and uh, Wikipedia and, and, and other commerce and information products. But when you take this long tail example and you apply it to currency, you apply it to money, you apply it to value exchange networks between people, when you let people form their own networks, create their own currencies, what we expect to see is two to three orders of magnitude in usage in that long tail of user generated currencies over the big currencies that we know, like the dollar, the euro, or Bitcoin, and Ether. And when you're talking about currencies, what does this volume represent? It's not buys of products, or views of videos, or reads of a blog. It is human collaboration. We use money as a tool to collaborate. And we expect to see hundreds of trillions of dollars of value in human collaboration as a result of letting anyone create a currency. Thank you. I, f I think we have time maybe for one question. I think there should be time. I just accidentally logged myself out of this. OK, there we go. Um, cool. So yeah, the questions from the audience are, we accepted our current wealth distribution history don't think don't you think that starting from scratch will be will with an even more unevenly initiate distribution causes chaos i don't think i'm pronouncing that I, right or it's not i get it um so it's a big question and there's a lot of assumptions here so i would first of all say that um i don't know if we accepted our current wealth distribution system um, i don't know if we were asked today if we accept it if we do in fact accept it we're of course not asked if we accept it um, the current wealth distribution system starts with gods and continues to kings and lords and presidents and parliaments um, and i don't know how uh how accepted it is but it certainly is entrenched there's no doubt about that the interesting thing about blockchain and the potential for user-generated currencies is that the system can change all the time. That is the nature of the system. It can birth new systems within the system. And an even more interesting aspect for the technology product developers around us is what's called a fork. So the beautiful thing about a blockchain protocol, hopefully, is that each user owns their data. Why is that significant? because at any moment you can take your data and you can move to another product. You can't leave Facebook in this way, you can't leave many of the accounts that you use and own or think you own or feel you own in this way. And so with money, when we'll be able to voluntarily move from system to system, I think we'll see a completely different uh, outcome in terms of what the people actually want. Um, Alicia asked, EU recently rejected EastCoin uh, nationwide initiative by tech savvy Eastland. Do you think mm. global leaders will actually give up power allowing alternative currencies? It's a beautiful question. Um, I wish I had the answer. If we look at history, we see that holders of power seldom voluntarily relinquish power. Uh, what I think is the most exciting about blockchain about this time in history that we find ourselves in and about communities like Tech Open Air and events like this is that we are going to be the global leaders. Maybe not today, maybe not tomorrow, but soon and hopefully sooner than people think. So if any of us take any of this with us to our neighborhoods, to our communities, to our companies, to our countries, um, I, think, uh, I think we have a shot. I think that's actually all the time we have for questions, cool. but you are doing an AMA. Yes, I'll be doing an AMA in the AMA room. Um, I hope I will find it, <laughs> and you will too. And so come out there, ask me anything, and I'll answer some things. Thanks so much for Thanks your talk. Thanks, you guys.